Good afternoon. My name is Matthew Sackle, and I'm the Associate Manager of Education and Programs at the Illinois Holocaust Museum. Thank you for logging in today's Lunch and Learn program, Everything's Kosher. As our exhibition, Delhi, I'll Have What She's Having, comes to an end this Sunday, our last program in our series is about this heartfelt documentary that spans countries, generations, and cultures. And now an introduction to Adam Fried. A divorced Jewish father from Chicago finds himself living in Germany to be with his only daughter. As he rediscovers his Jewish heritage, he must reconcile with his dying father in order to move forward and break the pattern of trauma and abandonment that has followed his family for generations. Along the way, in his search for peace, love, and pastrami, he attempts to reconnect with family, friends, and faith, and decides to open a Jewish deli in a small town with a history of anti-Semitism and Nazi activity during World War II. I would like to introduce this father, entrepreneur, and part-time filmmaker, Adam. He grew up in Deerfield and has been living in Germany for the past five years. In the US, he was a business owner and all around adventure seeker. He met his wife while on vacation in Germany and moved there to be closer to her family in Southern Bavaria. His filmmaking journey started while waking, walking, waking through his, walking through his new Bavarian town. His wife pointed to a five story apartment building and said, that used to be a concentration camp. He didn't believe her. From that point on, he has been obsessed about discovering the history all around him. He has an award-winning short film that have been shown all around the world and a series about hidden camps in development and a feature length documentary called Everything's Kosher coming out this year. Adam is here to give us some behind the scenes information about his latest films and discuss what it's like to live in Germany as a Jewish person where you can't find a good skirt steak sandwich to save your life. Please welcome Adam Fried. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep, good. Um, well, thank you very much for having me. And I think I'm gonna kick it off by sharing my screen. And we're gonna start with a, a contest, okay? So this is gonna be a very informal but interactive presentation. So I, I need everyone's help with um, I actually, we're going to com complete my film with, with um, letting me know if, uh, if I should have a certain scene in the film. And, but I'm going to kick it off with something that's kind of fun, I think. Okay, so welcome everyone and thank you for attending. I am honored to be speaking for, uh, on behalf with the museum. Um, when I was asked to, to do this, I, I felt extremely honored. I've been living in Germany for about five years now, and I've, some of the things I've discovered here have been extremely, extremely interesting. I grew up in Deerfield, and I grew up Jewish um, in a very you know, Jewish neighborhood, and we learned about the Holocaust and everything. And, but when you live here in Germany, um, it's different. And I want to show you, I, I'm keeping my presentation kind of uh, a little loose, so I'm just going to click on the slides, but we're going to have a little contest, okay? So Everything's Kosher is my feature documentary that's due out this summer, fall. Uh, we're finishing it up now. So um, in the chat, I'm going to put a, a link, um, or actually, no, I'm sorry. If you, if you know the answer to this question, I'm going to have you put it in the chat so I can read it. Okay, or just so I can know who who wins. So this is a contest for two free tickets. So this is a little story. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask. This is a question of how do you tie in um, a very one of the most famous U.S. musicians to my town here in Regensburg? Okay, and and everyone knows him, but let's see who gets him first. Um, this is a hanger that I own. And it was given to me by a woman who lives in this town. And it's from a business called Kaufhaus Teats. And oops. sorry, the pole keeps popping up in front of me. 
So the Kaufhaus Tietz was one of the first German department stores. And this is what it looked like in the 20s. And I went to the corner there and I took a little video because I wanted to see the before and after. So this is what it is today. It's in the middle of the town. It's about two blocks from my house. And this is what it looked like the day after Kristallnacht in 1938. So what happened was the Tietz family had these, these businesses, these um, department stores all over Germany. And during the Aryanization of Jewish businesses by Germans, it was taken over by a man named George Karg. And sorry, I keep getting a pop up. It was taken over by George Karg. He was a German businessman, took it over from the Tietz family. And what's interesting is George Karg also took over a, another business from a Jewish businessman. And this businessman's name was Carl Amson Joel. Now, if you can guess, Carl Amson Joel is, has a very famous grandson. So if you know it, just put it in the chat or the, uh, the Q and A area and I can get, I can, I can see, but who, who was his grandson? Give you a second. And if you haven't guessed it already, it was Billy Joel. So that's my connection to uh, uh, this, this, this famous musician who I would love to see someday in Madison Square Garden. Um, and what's interesting is when I was looking for a composer for my film, um, obviously I can't afford Billy Joel, but I found a very interesting man. Um, he, was, he, he was sent to me from a, a, recommended to me from a friend who I grew up with, who's a, a, a beautiful singer. Her name is Katie Liner. And she had this friend named, um, wait a second, hold on one second. <laughs> um, Alex Worman. My brain had a freeze there. So Alex Worman is a, a world-class composer. And when he saw my film, he was instantly connected to it. So I wanna play a little video of him talking about his background. He grew up, his family, what, his, his parents were Holocaust survivors. So there, he was instantly connected to me and my film, Everything's Kosher, which I'm gonna show you the trailer in, in a minute. But let me just tell you a little bit about Alex, cause he's uh, pretty interesting. You have a connection with your family through the Holocaust. My father and mother met in London. My father had run from the SS when he was 14. Did not get taken away that day, but his dad did. And my grandmother took my dad to London and left him there with, with a family that was receiving refugees. My grandfather was incarcerated for a while, but this was early days because he was a lawyer who was project, protecting Jews. My grandmother left my dad, went back, and appealed to the one of my, my father's classmates' dad, who was a, an SS soldier, uh, appealed to his better judgment and just begged and begged very courageously and was, made, was managed to, was able to free my grandfather. March of the Penguins was, was a, a wonderful thing that I didn't really know. First of all, it's a beautiful film. There are gorgeous creatures in it. Then when they had Morgan Freeman narrated, I was able to, I was given the opportunity to take his narration and work the score and work the narration. So there was this beautiful, serene timing between the narration and the music. The first time I saw the film, I was, uh, I was enlightened by how far I've come as a human that I could then see something like this and remember all of those things that I had not thought about for so long and identify with so many things that were really true to the way I grew up. So I felt very close to you and the movie immediately when I saw it.
So that was Alex. And so I'm going to give you a little bit about a little bit of background about everything's kosher and what led me to it. So after moving here, um, there were a lot of foods that I was missing. And uh, I walk into the, the Metzgerai or the butcher um, and I ask them for a skirt steak sandwich. And they looked at me like I was crazy. Um, I would bring in pictures of the cow and I would say, you know, this is what I'm looking for. You can, and again, I could not find it anywhere here. And when I found a, one of the Bavarian um, butchers who spoke some English, they explained to me that that's not a cut of meat that, that is enticing to the Germans. And it, it started to explain to me a lot about, this is what woke me up to my Jewish heritage more. Um, it was, the, the skirt steak was considered a, a second class cut of meat. And so your average German wouldn't eat it. Um, I grew up grilling, as probably a lot of people here, grilling skirt steaks in, in, the, back, in the backyard on Sundays with my family. Um, and it was one of my, one of the foods that I just really, really missed from, um, you know, from my life. And one of the other things I'm gonna show you before I, I show you the trailer. This is the Coliseum. Um, and this is when my wife was, and I were walking by it uh, and, and she pointed to it and said, that was a concentration camp. And I said, no way. I didn't believe her because I grew up Jewish. I never heard about these. And this is what started my obsession with learning about everything about this camp, but also it opened my eyes to all of the other sub camps that no one knows about and no one had heard about. So I wanted to find out more. So this is a map of, so I live in a town called Regensburg and it's down here towards the bottom. And what happened was the, the, there were about 500 prisoners that were sent down from Flossenburg. This was a work camp. And after the allies bombed Regensburg, um, they used to make fighter planes here. They sent down prisoners to clear, clear out the, the train station and fix the train tracks and work in the factories. And they all came from Flossenburg. I had never heard of Flossenburg. So this is what kind of started my obsession with wanting to learn all I could. I ended up getting a book about these camps because you know, I grew up learning and, and all I knew was, was Auschwitz or Dachau, but there were thousands of these smaller camps. So for me, it was just super fascinating, um, maddening at the same time, because it's different when you live here and you have to see it every day. Um, so this is what inspired me to make my film, uh, Everything's Kosher. So I'm gonna play you the trailer for that. Uh, I think you're gonna hopefully enjoy it. And then we'll get into some more, some more discussion about it. Show of hands. Who thinks I'm crazy to open up a Jewish deli in Germany? And that would be the best way to lose a million dollars. I feel like I'm the only Jew in Germany. You're not. Do you make challah bread? No. Are you Jewish? No, I'm not Jewish. You no. see my hair? I would give my right hand for a garbage disposal. I don't even know what it is. They don't build it in Germany. Maybe they are scared of... of... Since my ex was German, she wanted to raise our child in Germany. So if I wanted to be any kind of dad, I had to move there. I have to figure out how I'm going to support myself and my daughter. I don't want to stay. As soon as I drop her off, she switches to German with her mom. And she says, Papa Bleiben. Papa Bleiben means Papa stay. The year before I had my bar mitzvah, that's when my father left our family. Who leaves their kids with a letter? Doesn't even say goodbye. After that, I didn't care about being Jewish. Almost 500 people were crammed into one of those floors. It was used as a sub concentration camp. Over 40 of the prisoners died in this camp. They would just toss them in the river. You can read about it in books, but when you're living here, <sighs> there's something that's connecting me to being Jewish again. 
Our tradition uses the mezuzah on the door. When you see it, it reminds you that you have a job to do. And perhaps that's a key to what you teach your daughter too. You can't get a corned beef sandwich to save your life there. You can't even find a skirt steak in Germany. That is quite depressing. This is like a taste of home. If I can bring this flavor to where I live in Germany, that would be amazing. This sounds crazy, but I'm thinking about a Jewish deli in Germany. Are you joking or is this? Anywhere else in America, it would be tough. If you're gonna do it right, it's like being the Navy SEALs of restaurants. Be careful what you wish for. I miss a connection with a group of people. It's more about community. The people is family. My sister and I have had a rocky relationship, but she's always been there for me. If you're really gonna open up a Jewish deli in Germany, I will come out and help you. Check out, all right. Ow! Maybe it's time to reach out to dad. He's at the end of his life. He's the only dad you have. You don't get another one. Dad, I hope someday you will get to meet my daughter in person. Love that. Now those are some pickles. It's almost like a pickle meditation. What are the chances of you bringing me 10 pounds of corned beef? We got the meat. The deli is saved! I'm not gonna be like my dad. I'm not gonna stop. Matzo balls are dropping. T minus three hours. Oh, God. My worst fear is no one shows up. If you don't believe in your product, why should I? As Jewish people say, lakayim. You are the best cook ever. <laughs> ever? I hope to see you at the deli. So, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, what's interesting is, you know, in making this film, this is my first, it was my first feature length film that we did, or that I, that I made. Last year I produced uh, and did a short film called The Walk. I'm sure a few of you have seen that. And it was about, you know, my life here living as a Jewish person in Germany. And, and what I just go through on the, a daily basis, just walking my dog through the city. So, but for this presentation and, and a little behind the scenes, um, I wanna talk about the deli and what happened and how we did it. And it, cause it's, it's pretty, it was pretty fascinating. So, I decide to open a Jewish deli in, in this city, or at least attempt it. And all my friends think I'm crazy. Um, but the, one of the hardest things was I could not find corned beef or pastrami or skirt steak anywhere. So it's literally two, and I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm letting out a couple secrets here, but it's literally two weeks before uh, we're supposed to do the, the deli. Uh, we, we decided to do a pop-up deli to test it out. So my sister is going to come help me. And in this scene, uh, this is me discussing her smuggling the meat to Germany. And, you know, I'd been back and forth to Germany, you know, dozens of times. Nothing ever got searched. And I told her, look, she worked for a food distributor. She was able to get 50 pounds of meat but if she doesn't make it through, through, um, through the, the airport, this isn't gonna happen. So she basically had 50 pounds of, of frozen meat um, wrapped up without a problem in her suitcase. And this is the moment where she either gets in and the, the deli is a, is a, is a, is a success or she doesn't. So I'm going to play it for you. And there's a there's a song in here um, by House of Pain. It's called Jump Around. Now, when you make a film and you want to put music in your film, you have to license it and clear it and pay for it. I cannot use this song in the movie, but in marketing uh, materials and just for the fun of it, I put it in there just to test it out. Uh, it would cost about $100,000 to use the song, so I will not be using the song unless a generous donor on this call would like to uh, pay for that song, which I don't think you want to. But all right, let me play, the, play you this scene, and I think you'll kind of get a kick out of it. Oh, and by the way, dogs are allowed at the airports in Munich. <laughs> all right, I got a big favor to ask you. What are the chances of you bringing me 10 pounds of corned beef? Oh my God. 
Where am I getting this corned beef? Well, Rich Levy turned me on to the corned beef factory in Chicago. You might be able to pick up 10 pounds of corned beef and take an extra suitcase and pack it with ice and just check it because you get two bags because I can't find corned beef anywhere here. And the one guy was, who I was supposed to get the pastrami from totally blew me fucked. Are you really opening up a deli? Like really doing this? Well, first I'm gonna do a pop-up and we're gonna test it out and we're just gonna see the reaction to these foods and see if people like it. I know there's a ton involved with it, but you know, I, I gotta do something. I gotta start somewhere. Okay, so here's what we're gonna have to do. I mean, I just put it in dry ice, bring it to the airport and I can check it. <laughs> the deli is saved. All right, she's landed. I hope that meat makes it. I mean, of course, I want my sister to be here, but I need my pastrami and corned beef. So it was rather fun uh, getting the meat and then introducing my sister to the Autobahn um, where you can drive as, as fast as you like. So uh, th that was a, definitely an experience. So something else that's, that's interesting about the town here. So this is, this is a, a picture from Regensburg from probably the, probably about the 1600s, 1700s. Um, that stone bridge is still there. It was built a thousand years ago. And Regensburg was actually settled by the Romans in 150 AD, I believe. It was the northernmost point of the Roman Empire. So yeah, it's got a, a ton of history here. And the synagogue, so when I, when I made the film, I had not been into the synagogue in the town. Um, and this is the actual synagogue that was built in 1901, uh, and it was destroyed during Kristallnacht, uh, where the fire marshal said to let it, let it burn, um, and it was destroyed. And it wasn't rebuilt until actually 2019. They had a, um, there's a, a, an interesting Jewish congregation here. Uh, there, a lot of them are from Russia, so, when I was doing my research on where my family came from, they were actually from Minsk, Russia. So it's a Russian Orthodox synagogue. And today it's, it's very beautiful. However, one of the things that just blew me away was there is a, an armed German police officer that stands outside of it whenever there is an event inside. And we'll take a quick look inside the, the synagogue. And here, this was an event, um, the, 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 a little bit of background, the German government does a lot to support the Jewish community in Germany, uh, as they should. 
Uh, and this was an event actually in honoring Kristallnacht uh, last November. And this is the inside of the synagogue. It's beautiful. I go there on Saturdays. And even though I don't understand what's going on with, with the English and German, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, all the services are in, in, in German. I speak very little German. But also, it's extremely powerful for me to sit there uh, and, and take it in and realize what Jewish people have, have struggled with and been through since the beginning of time just to be able to worship. So it's really powerful. I really enjoy going there. And for the Kiddush after the service, uh, there's a beautiful Kiddush lunch. And they actually, since most of them are, are Russian and, and Ukrainian, they bring vodka. So they're serving shots of, of vodka um, on Saturday morning at about 1130 in the morning. So I usually leave there very happy and enjoy the rest of my, my day. <laughs> so, and this is interesting. So this is my daughter uh, and she's actually standing in this. I make these little videos for my friends back in the US. And this is actually a video that was taken in the memorial to a synagogue that was actually from the 1500s in my town. And if you look right behind there, there's a, a massive church. Um, and this is actually where the Jewish quarter was in the town. There was a booming Jewish population here in the Middle Ages. And in the 1500s, they were banished from the city. Um, so in doing a little history for my friends, I send them this little video of my beautiful daughter. We run around, we play in this memorial and I'll just uh, let it play for you. Say hi to Rich. Yeah. Everyone, in the shadow of the church, this is the outline of the synagogue that was burned down in the 1500s. You might not know about it now, but you will know about it when the movie comes when it, out. When it's a little bit hot, then it's hot chocolate. Yeah, yeah. We're doing history. We're doing history. So that is my beautiful daughter. Um, and yeah, that's a lot of fun. Um, I have, there was another video I want to show you. And this was, uh, I'm not going to show you this video, I'll just talk about it for a second. This was another short film that we did that won a lot of awards last year called The Walk. I talked about it a little bit. Um, but at, what was interesting was after I made, we, we had filmed Everything's Kosher. And when it got into pre-production, um, there was still a story that I had to tell. And when I made the when I made everything's kosher, I, I wanted to be a little more uplifting. I did not want it to be a Holocaust movie. And we ended up producing um, I'm making the walk and, and you can actually you can find it online. Um, and if you register for the uh, your ticket for the uh, the world premiere of everything's kosher, there should be a link on that website to where um, you can watch the walk. And I put a link in the chat area. I'll also put it in the Q&A um, later towards the end. But um, The Walk is a pretty powerful film that I, I think you'll, it's pretty impactful. So there's one other thing I want to show you. And what's interesting about making films is you film all these things. And it, it, actually, in the trailer, some of you might know Rabbi Ike. He's with uh, Synagogue Macomb in, in the North Shore. Uh, and he was, in the, he was in the film, but I'm not sure if he's gonna make it in the, final, in the final cut, if you will. So this is kind of a fun um, exercise. And this is, there, there's a lot of scenes that we actually had to, had to delete. So this is, a, this is a, a scene that I want you to give me some feedback and let me know, should this be in the film or not? Right now it's not, but you know, as I showed my journey of what, it, what it's like for an American and a Jewish person to live in Germany, um, there's a lot of things that are different. And I wanted to show what it's like to be uh, a little bit of a fish out of water. So this scene, I'll set this up a little bit. This is, this is uh, deals with me dealing with the even the garbage in Germany. Um, 
Germans are extremely detail oriented, um, great engineers, but when it comes to the garbage, it took me, I'm still not used to it. So I'm gonna play the scene for you. And then I want you to tell me if it should be in the movie or not. Who is ein Müll, a Müll, yeah, the garbage can? Yeah. I can never figure out the garbage can. I swear to God, you need a PhD to figure out even the garbage system in Germany. There's black cans and green cans and yellow and brown. I think the plastic goes here. Then glass containers. I can't even put glass here. You have to take that to a separate part of the city. Lumpen, I think those are like rags, so I guess that's okay. Diverse kleine Teile, random small parts are okay. Bauschut, I don't know what that is. Stein, Stein material, I think that's like stone, stone material. Zeitung, so newspapers are okay. And then there's containers for the white glass, the brown glass, and the green glass. Well, green water. Green or brown? Brown. So you have to separate those. All right, so lids. Uh, do you put them in or no? Put it on here. <laughs> yeah, do that. If you don't get down here at the right time of the week and you miss the paper pickup, then you might as well take it back up to your place and start over the following week. Vishmutz's papier. I think that's like if you have dirty paper or something. That's not allowed. This paper goes somewhere else. Biotoni, I guess. A bio, that's organic. That's the organic there. I mean, when I was in Chicago, you'd open up the can, you'd take everything, you'd throw it in there, and it would say goodbye. If you do that here, they'll find out who you are and they'll give you a fine. Look, this person didn't break it down. I'm going to report them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, good. 72 cents. 72 cents. Thank you for helping me. Good luck for the future. All right. <laughs> So that, that nice gentleman, he owns a little wine shop in town, and literally I needed his help in figuring out what, uh, what, what, what is put where, and again, it's, it's, it's a very confusing process. So, um, okay, so in the, in the, again, in either in the Q&A or the chat area, um, if you like that scene and you think it should be added to the film or kept into the film, uh, please, you know, let me know. And if you have any other uh, other questions, please put it in there, and I'd be happy to answer them as we as I get through with the kind of the the formal part of my my presentation. Um, and a couple people have asked, what am I working on? Well, let me. One of the one of the things I'm working on is, you know, after discovering the the sub camp in my town. Um, and talking to people back in the US and having no one had, had heard about these or very few people. I'm I'm doing I'm pitching a series. I'm going to actually to the Cannes Film Festival um, in, next month in, in France. And they're having they have a film market there. And I'm pitching a series about these hidden camps to producers and broadcasters there. So I'm, I'm really excited about that someday. I hope to share it with everyone and maybe even get it on Netflix. But uh, I think it's an important, important, an important series to keep the history of what happened with the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, keeping that alive. As we know, it's extremely important most, you know, even today. And um, I'm excited about doing that. And one, one last thing, and then I'll go, open it up to some questions. So there's something called Stoppelsteine. And the Stoppelsteine are these plaques that have been placed in the street. And Stoppelsteine stands for stumbling stones. And these stones are from Berta and Edith Shield. Um, and when I started doing it, they're, they're about two blocks from my house. And when I, when I wanted to research on, on why they were there, um, and they represent Jewish, a Jewish person or family who was basically killed during the Holocaust. And Berdith and the, the, the father was Berthold. And Berthold was a Jewish butcher, a, Jew, a kosher butcher. And they lived on the second floor of this building here. They, there we go. Um, the kosher butcher shop was here. There's a jewelry store there today. And 
Berthold was forced to sell his, his kosher butcher shop. He, they were forced to live on the third floor. A German family purchased the, uh, or, or Jew, a, a German business person took over the business and the, the family was, was forced to leave. Um, and this is one of those things where living here, when I walk around the city and I see these, these stones and I learn about the history, it's, uh, I can't walk by these without thinking of them. Um, so it's pretty powerful for me. And this is why I wanted to make my films and share you know, the knowledge of what I've learned here, but also, again, keeping that, that history alive. So I'm going to now stop sharing and then you can see me again and see Matthew and we can open this up to uh, maybe some questions that are that have been out there. Well, I want to get uh, some some questions that, that that I personally have for you. Um, the one it seems like uh, you sort of uh, as an entrepreneur from Chicago, uh, how did it sounds like you kind of accidentally became a filmmaker. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what what took you into this medium? Yeah, sure. So it's it was it's I've always loved documentary films. I've loved photography and video and, and editing and and you know in the US I was an I'm an entrepreneur. You know, I owned a printing business that basically did printing for professional photographers. But now that I when I when I moved here, I, I basically said, okay, I have to find something to do. And, you know, a little bit more of the backstory. I met my wife in, in Munich. Um, I was here on vacation. We end up getting married within six months, whirlwind romance. Then we get to know each other and things aren't going so well. Then she, we get pregnant. And that's when we said, okay, last ditch effort. Let's move to Germany where her family is from. Um, we have our, our, our beautiful daughter, but we decided to, to split. So we got divorced. So here I find myself as a Jewish man living in this Bavarian town, Regensburg, Germany. And I look at myself and I say, what am I going to do now? So when I found out about the, the sub camp, um, I was fascinated with it. And, you know, there's a, there's... <laughs> There's a, 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 a there's a Thai restaurant. There was a Thai restaurant in the bottom of it, and when I started doing the research, that history of that camp was hidden away until the like the 80s or early 90s. Um, it was one of those things where, you know, in Germany, there's always that thing of people don't talk about it. Well, there's a there's a reason why they don't talk about it because what they experienced what they saw was either so horrific or what they did was so horrific that they didn't talk about it for a generation. Um, the Germans of today are much more likely to talk about what happened, um, but it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Like even my, my daughter's great grandfather, who was still alive um, as of last year, he flew one of those planes, the, uh, that was produced here in Regensburg for um, a company called Messer, uh, Messerschmitt. So the Messerschmitt fighter plane, he actually flew one of those planes. And that was a, a big thing that I discovered was everyone here has a story. So I wanted to tell the story of, of what I saw or what I've experienced here from the perspective of a Jewish person living here. And when I moved here, I wasn't, you know, my Jewish heritage wasn't even that important to me. But after living here and seeing the, you know, learning about what happened here and the things that I've seen, I said, you know what, I'm, it really just awoke my, my Jewish heritage again and, and being proud of being Jewish again. Um, and that kind of led me into making, wanting to make films and kind of dedicating a large portion of my life to keeping this, you know, showing this history of what happened um, and, and making, trying to make as many films as possible. Now, as a librarian, uh, the, the backstories that you're sharing are amazing. Where are you finding this information? Uh, you said you had some limited German. Um, are, are you able to find resources that you're able to use or are you having them translated or 
where are you going for these things? It's yeah, it's interesting. It's a little bit of everything. Uh, it is difficult. It's it's I've gotten by without speaking that much German. I can speak some. Um, I was in a German a Sprachschule, which is a language school. Uh, I was the oldest person in there, <laughs> and uh, I was learning German. And then COVID hit, and they shut down all the language schools. And when you're sitting at home. Um, um, quarantined, the last thing you want to do is, is try to learn German. So uh, that kind of fell to the wayside. My beautiful daughter can speak very good English and German. Um, but what's also interesting, when she first started talking, she spoke some words in Bayerisch, it's called. So it's basically a Bavarian dialect that she started picking up from Oma and Opa, Grandma and Grandpa. Um, and when she started doing that, I said, wait a minute, what am I even learning German for? So I kind of put that on hold. But I ended up and in, in, in the presentation, I showed that stack of books. And those books were, I ordered a, um, a set of, it's, it's like an encyclopedia of all these camps. Yep. And the first, the first, um, the edition I ordered was a thousand pages thick. Okay, it's, it's like that. And then I realized, oh, that's only one out of a series of six or seven of these books. And when I started reading through it, it was just, it goes, you know, the, the, it goes very deep. So what I'm trying to do with, with my, my series is pick, what's, what's, what a lot of people don't know is a lot of, you know, there were these sub camps, not only in Germany, but also in Austria, um, in Italy, in France, in Poland, I mean, everywhere. And th what happened at these camps, these work camps was, was absolutely horrific. Um, so I'm trying to build stories around that and tie it into today. Are you able to find information locally or do you have to sort of uh, leave the nest to find these stories? Yeah, that's interesting because I do, I, it's dealing with the, the German bureaucracy, <laughs> local governments and things, uh, is schwer. Schwer means hard, difficult in Deutsch. So uh, it's it's very difficult dealing with them. Um, there's there are amazing archives, but you really need a German speaking native to go in there and and get that information. But what I have found, so when I when I released the walk last year, mm -hmm. um, it's I've gotten great press from it. Uh, it's been shown not only in the US, but also at film festivals here in Germany. And, but it's different. It's different when you present a film and do a discussion to um, 200 Jewish people in the US versus showing it to 100 Germans who are from this town, um, showing it to them here. So it's, uh, I, had to, I had to walk kind of an interesting line in, in you know, changing up my presentation to to discuss it or do it here but but everyone has been very supportive um and like i said local historians here are willing to talk to me um i've mm -hmm. talked with reporters here so it's i've been able to get out a lot of information to help um to build these stories so we've got a question from the audience asking uh how did uh, the people uh, respond to the deli and did they like the corned beef? <laughs> yes, it's, it's, they were, they were, they loved the corned beef. And, and honestly, hardly anyone there knew what a skirt steak was. I made skirt steak sandwiches for 80 people. <laughs> so they ate it all up. Uh, the pastrami, the corned beef, I made kosher pickles. Um, what else? We didn't have chopped liver, but we did have gefilte fish. Mm. And when I serve it, when I was explaining to these native Germans of what gefilte fish was, I'm like, it's kind of like a fish meatball and it's cold. <laughs> so <laughs> most people liked it. And I said, oh, here, try this red stuff. It's horseradish. Uh, and, and horseradish in German is called miratesh. Miratish. So um, they enjoyed it. And in the, of course, in the film where I ask, I ended up getting all the desserts for, for the deli opening from this um, 
from these two Bavarian ladies who have a, like a, a dessert food truck. And a week before I go there and I ask them for rugula. And they're like, yes, rugula. And I'm in the, in the film, we have this and, and they hand it to me and it's, it's as big as a croissant. And I'm like, <laughs> well, it's kind of, I, and in the film, I, I have a subtitle, it says almost rugula. <laughs> so, but it was, it was good, but it was definitely not rugula. Um, and, and I asked them, they're in the film, and then I asked them, Do you, did you like the fish? And her quick answer is no. <laughs> but overall, everyone ate, everyone drank. And maybe at the end of the movie, you might see me leading um, all of the Germans in a rousing rendition of, rendition of Hava Nagila and making them dance and having a, a, a really good time. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, do you think that um, it, you could, one of the other questions is, are there any butchers now in the area that now that they've seen people have a taste for this would be willing to work with you to get these sorts of things for you? I don't know. I don't know. And there's actually um, on, a block away from my house is the actual street that in my town where Kristallnacht happened. Uh, one of the streets the, it's and there's an my favorite Italian deli is there um, and I go in there and I get sandwiches and and he does have some pastrami there every now and then that he actually imports so you know I, I, I made the film I did the pop up it went extremely well and you know one of the biggest questions I get asked is is the deli open and I say well come to Germany and I'll make you a, a great corned beef sandwich. Um, and, but you'll have to watch the film to figure out exactly what's going on with it. One of the things that we've learned, uh, the public has learned here is that um, the Jewish deli eventually evolved to not just cater to Jews because quite frankly, that wouldn't be enough people to support a business. So they wanted to make it uh, and create a community space for everybody to come in. Um, do you think that there's a taste for that there? And how big is the Jewish community in Regensburg? Yeah, great questions. So the Jewish community here, they say there's a thousand people. Oh. And, you know, Regensburg is a town of, a, of 150, 160,000 people. So to have less than 1% be Jewish makes sense. Um, they're... It's, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. The Jewish community here kind of, you know, keeps, you know, they keep a low profile. Um, I see the same 20, 30, 40 people on Saturdays, you know, during the year um, going to the services. And again, most of them don't speak English, but, um, but yeah, they've been, they've, they've been warm and inviting to me and, and, you know, have been supportive of, of me filming there. So it's been, um, yeah, it's been a, a journey to connect with them, but um, I, I do enjoy it. So, and sorry, what was the other part of the question? I might've missed that. Uh, no, 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 just that, uh, do you think there's a taste for, for deli in your community? Yeah, so that's interesting. And it, it, it is interesting that, uh, that uh, there's a decent amount of German foods that are very, you know, they're very similar. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. They love a chopped liver, you know, a Leberwurst sandwich, it's called, um, you know, a, a, a chopped liver they like, but um, no, they like, like, I'm, I might, I'm, I'm going to try that. I'm going to attempt that. I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can request it. There's a, there's an online butcher um, called Kreutzer's, I believe. And that's where I've gotten my skirt steak from. They'll ship it frozen and but there's, you know, there's there's nothing like walking into the butcher and being able to request no, no, it. No, 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 no. It's 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 actually also kind of fascinating to think that the roots of uh, a Jewish deli here in the United States, like in Manhattan, the boroughs, there would have been four delis right next to each other, each one of them specializing in their own thing. In your community, I'm not sure how happy the Italian deli guy would be if you popped up next to him. But it's interesting to think that it's the Jewish food that we have here has its roots in German food. So essentially you're playing a game of post office. You're taking German food, bringing it to America, 
and now taking the American food back to Germany. And so I'm wondering what kind of evolution that that could create. Yeah, no, it, it would be interesting. And, you know, when I got done with, when we got done with the deli or the, you know, the, the, the film and the pop-up and it went really well, yeah, I started looking around. This has been an interesting fact. <laughs> I started looking around and because a friend of mine had a restaurant um, and he let me use it and we converted it. We transformed it into a New York Jewish deli for one night. And it was really powerful. It was really interesting and powerful. Now, since that we've ended filming, and this is a really interesting, there's a location that has come up and the location is in the actual Colosseum or, or in the, where the sub camp was located. So there was the, 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 the Thai restaurant went out and I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to put, to put this, you know, and the deli is called Friedman's Deli because my name, my last name is Freed, but it was shortened from Friedman. And I didn't find that out until I started doing the research for the film and found that out where my, where my, you know, great grandparents came from and, and were they involved in the, you know, with the Holocaust and everything. So it was pretty powerful to see that. But if I were going to put, going to put it anywhere in this town, I would put it there. Now, can, can it support, um, uh, could it be a supportive in a business, you know, long-term? I'm not sure. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, and when your film premieres, will it be premiering in the United States or will it be premiering in Europe? It's a good question. So I'm going to put a link. Let's see. I'm going to put a link in the chat and send it to everyone. And if you're interested in coming to the one of the world premieres, we're going to have a world premiere. I'm shooting for Highland Park in the fall. Oh, well, okay? we'd like that. Yes, yes. And maybe I would love to, I would love to, we'll figure out if we can do a showing at the museum as well, because I would love to do that. <laughs> Come um, play with us again. Yes. So, so if you click on that link, you can register, um, you know, your name, your email. And when I have a firm date, I'll be sending that out to everyone. You can get your tickets and, um, but we'll have, I want the world premiere to be in either Highland Park or at the Chicago International Film Festival. I'm trying to get into that. So if anyone has any connections, please let me know. <laughs> um, and then I definitely wanna play it in Highland Park because I grew up in Deerfield. My mom taught at West Ridge um, in uh, the wow. Park District in Highland Park. So, you know, I obviously have a great connection with the North Shore. And so, yeah, we're looking, we're looking forward to that. But then we will also be having world premieres. I also got into the Miami Jewish Film Festival in January of next hey, year. Southernmost so, point in New York. All right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, trying to make it happen. But, but um, uh, and, 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 you know, you can follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Adam Freed, and um, kind of keep in keep uh see what's going on with the journey of this film for sure well thank you so much for your time adam and thank you for sharing this awesome and fun adventure that you've been on and uh with this beautiful product uh as a result um i just want to remind our audience to check out our up and coming on-site program april 21st uh confronting anti-semitism uh it's actually an on-site program April 21st, Confronting Anti-Semitism, a training for parents and caregivers. And on May 1st at 6.30 p.m., the grand opening of our brand new Spaghet Family Voices of Genocide exhibition, which explores how and why genocide continues to occur across our geography and time. This event is free to the, uh, to the community. And there's also a reception beforehand that you're all welcome to attend. Uh, just visit our events page and sign up for that. And as a reminder, our Delhi exhibition closes this Sunday. So if you haven't come to see the exhibition yet, if this didn't inspire you enough, um, you still have four days left to come and visit the exhibition. And again, Adam, thank you so much for spending an hour with us here in Skokie, all the way from Germany. 
Yeah, thank you, Matthew. And I, I just realized as we're talking, the sun was going down and my lighting completely got shut down here. <laughs> <laughs> now it's it's dinner time and I am so hungry for a corned beef sandwich. Um, I, I got to find it somewhere here, but I, I know I can't. Maybe your sister left a suitcase behind. I, I don't know. Good idea. Good idea. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. And again, thank you, Adam. All right. Thank, thank you very much for having me. It was, it was absolutely an honor, but thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.